Bonjour, bienvenue. Good morning, welcome. We're here this morning to talk about what Canadians are talking about, what Canadians want parliamentarians to talk about, and what Canadian parliamentarians are, for the most part, not talking about. And that's the climate crisis as manifested in wildfires across the country. Uh, right now, upstairs, I just uh, left the chamber, and thanks to the Bloc Québécois Business of Supply motion, we will be debating forest fires today in this House. I do want to also start by saying that I've been very grateful for the Minister of Emergency Preparedness, the Honourable Bill Blair, holding briefings for leaders of all the parties in Parliament and keeping us up to date on the state of the wildfires. And I, his efforts are nonpartisan and really welcome in bringing uh, members of, and including leaders of the Conservative Party, the New Democrats, members of the Bloc Québécois, into briefings to update us on the fires. The risk forecast for the rest of this summer is not good. I think everyone knows that now. We are going to continue to expect hot, dry conditions. The likelihood is that this fire season will be long. But for the month of May 2023, it's clear we smashed all records. In the last 10 years, the average area burnt in the month of May for Canada, all of Canada, is 150,000 hectares. This month of May, more than 2 million hectares were burnt. We use the term order of magnitude often without necessarily knowing what it means. Here's an object lesson in an order of magnitude leap. An order of magnitude is anything that leaps by a factor of 10. This year, the month of May burned 14 times more than the average over the last 10 years. So a brief critique of the other parties, and I'll turn to my colleague Mike Morris to add more. Je suis désolé par les commentaires de le chef de l'opposition, Monsieur Poilievre, qui a dit pas un seul mot au sujet de changement climatique, de crise climatique et les incendies partout au Canada. Yesterday, it was pretty noticeable that the only time Pierre Poilievre used the word fire, it was calling on the government to fire the former governor general. Otherwise, fire is not on his lips. Then we look at the Liberals who are so busy in self-congratulatory rhetoric about how they understand we're in a climate emergency. They know that climate change is real. But at the same time that they trot out measures to reduce greenhouse gases, they also continue to fund fossil fuels through subsidies, to build a $30 billion white elephant of a dangerous pipeline, and at the same time, to open up new areas for oil and gas, shamefully approving Bay de Nord, where we've gotten a reprieve recently because Econor, the Norwegian company proposing to drill deep ocean drilling off the coast of Newfoundland and Labrador, have issued a statement that due to market conditions, they're going to wait at least three years. But just this week, we had this appalling statement from Minister of Natural Resources, Jonathan Wilkinson, that it was okay for British Petroleum to conduct exploratory activities for oil and gas in what we had been told was a marine protected area, the Northeast Newfoundland Slope Closure. By the way, oil and gas exploratory activities in the marine environment are very dangerous to the marine environment. Seismic testing damages multiple species, and all of the activities in trying to determine if oil and gas can be found in the North Shore Newfoundland Slope, marine conserving area, those activities can damage the marine environment. But what if BP finds oil in an area that's supposed to be set aside for conservation. According to Minister Wilkinson, as quoted in the CBC, quote, we would remove it from the protected status that Canada has put in place. I just yesterday got answers to questions on the order paper that I had put forward because the budget of 2023 includes millions of dollars under the heading Future Arctic Offshore Oil and Gas Development. 
But every time anyone, particularly my friends in the Liberal Caucus, who were upset when I mentioned on the floor of the House of Commons that future Arctic offshore oil and gas drilling was in the budget, they were told, don't worry, there's a moratorium, don't worry, we're not really going to go for Arctic oil and gas. But I put the question on the order paper with regards to the funds allocated for future Arctic offshore oil and gas development in budget 2023, what's intended? The answer came back that the moratorium is remaining in place from 2017, but the money's being spent so that, quote, any future oil and gas development in Canada's Arctic waters is consistent with the highest safety and environmental standards. This last bit, which I, I do have copies of this question on the order paper if the media want to take one from me at the end of this press conference, quote, the Arct Arctic Offshore Oil and Gas Moratorium announced in December 2016 is indefinite and will remain in force until such time as it may be repealed. In other words, this government believes, the Liberals believe, you can be climate champions and decry the Conservatives for ha failure to have a plan, but their plan can be repealed any time because developing new offshore oil and gas is still okay with the Liberals under a climate plan. Building a pipeline to expand fossil fuel production out of the oil sands is okay because we have to get bitumen to markets, really? And bottom line, the Liberals don't understand we're in a climate emergency, and they will continue to develop fossil fuels to, to pour fuel on the fires that are consuming this country right now. And I'll turn to Mike Morris. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, uh, and, and thank you all for, for being here this morning. Uh, the fact is, our country is literally on fire wildfires in seven of 10 provinces right now, smoke lit in the chamber as we have a so-called take note emergency debate on these wildfires. The climate crisis is now on our doorstep. And as you heard from Ms. May, this is a time where we should be seeing that same all hands on deck approach that we're seeing reactively in response to the wildfires is, what, is what, sci what scientists, indigenous leaders, and young people have been calling for for decades, for a truly all-hands approach to addressing the climate emergency. And what better time than now to finally say, is it not time enough is enough to stop giving public funds to the very sector most responsible for the crisis that we're in? That that same $20 billion dollars Three billion more this week alone for the TMX pipeline. Are not those dollars better spent investing in proven climate solutions? While parents in Ontario, as one example, are thinking about whether they can take their children to a playground for fear of, 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 of inhaling the air. It's past time, enough is enough, to respond to this crisis with the urgency it demands. And that starts with redirecting those funds to the proven solutions we need. Really appreciate the media that are here with us this morning. Merci à tous et à toutes pour être ici avec nous. Et nous sommes ici pour uh, répondre à votre oui. question. Et Pardon. Oui. Pardon. Seulement, désolé, j'ai oublié, de, de, avec un petit sommaire en français, un petit résumé, on doit maintenant faire face à l'urgence de changement climatique. On doit faire face à la crise de changement climatique et la réalité que ce n'est pas possible de faire les deux en même temps. Faire une lutte contre le, la crise de changement climatique et en même temps donner les subventions vers l'industrie d'énergie fossile. On doit maintenant agir et on doit maintenant agir rapidement. Ce n'est pas, pas trop tôt, mais le temps presse. C'est presque trop tard pour, pour protéger notre climat, pour euh, l'avenir. Mais maintenant, nous avons la chance de faire un grand changement en politique. Ça, c'est urgent et nécessaire. Merci.
Ah, oui, le, le gouvernement a, avait dit qu'il allait éliminer des, des subventions aux énergies fossiles. Est-ce que vous savez où, où on en est dans ces travaux-là? Avez-vous suivi euh, ce qu'il a fait jusqu'à maintenant? Ce n'est pas vrai. Le gouvernement fédéral a donné la subvention vers l'énergie fossile dans quelque façon. Le plus grand, comme Mike Morris a déjà dit, c'est le, le coût de l'oléoduc Trans Mountain. Les coûts maintenant sont presque 30 milliards et le gouvernement fédéral, euh, malgré que Mme euh, Freeland a dit que pas un autre euh, dollar, mais ce n'est pas vrai parce que le gouvernement fédéral est euh, responsable pour les dettes de Trans Mountain. C'est une entreprise fédérale de Cajon, c'est notre projet. Et le dette, c'est plus de ces milliards et milliards. C'est chaque année, c'est 7, euh, 7 100 euh, dollars dans l'intérêt seulement. Ça, c'est la responsabilité de nous comme Canadiens. Aussi, dans l'idée faux de le, euh, le en anglais, pardonnez-moi, le cap carbon capture and storage. Ça, c'est une idée euh, très chère qui ne manque bien pas du tout. Il marche pas, marche, euh, euh, il a les résultats très pauvres, il est euh, fiable, mais l'effort le, le, pour euh, l'énergie propre, euh, selon le gouvernement du Canada, aussi euh, inclut les projets d'énergie fossile, les projets comme le uh, Carbon Capture and Storage, et aussi maintenant dans le budget de 2023, une nouvelle subvention pour hydrogène qui était obtenue dans les um, uh, façons qui incluent uh, l'utilisation d'énergie fossile. Uh, la réalité, c'est que le gouvernement du Canada uh, continue de donner la subvention le, de et aussi leur, euh, euh, de donner les, les preuves pour les projets d'énergie fossile dans un temps quand il est tellement clair que ce n'est pas possible, avec les, la, la vie de GIEC, d'avoir un seul, un seul additionnel projet comme ça. Le gouvernement du Canada euh, euh, donne l'appui à, à quelques projets seulement dans les derniers euh, quelques mois. Si je peux ajouter brièvement, Uh, le gouvernement fédéral parle avec les belles paroles d'éliminer les subventions uh, pour les, les industries pétrolières dans l'année 2025, mais dans ce budget 2023, il y a une, une addition de, 3, de plus de 3,3 milliards de dollars sur les subventions. Alors, il, uh, ça, c'est dans ce budget 2023. Mm -hmm. C'est dur sur euh, M. Poilievre puis sa, sa posture cette semaine par rapport au wildfire. À, plus largement, au niveau du mouvement conservateur, on a vu le tweet de M. Bernier euh, concernant les, les terroristes verts qui auraient mis le feu euh, aux forêts. Euh, je me demande quel argument est-ce que vous pouvez utiliser pour convaincre cette frange-là de la population et, et du mouvement politique conservateur pour les, con, les convaincre finalement du bien fondé de votre approche. Oui, c'est une, euh, une, une, une question importante. Euh, je suis déçue par les commentaires de M. Poilievre, puis aussi de M. Bernier. La réalité, c'est que dans les caucus des conservateurs ici, il y a plusieurs députés conservateurs qui comprennent bien les menaces de changement climatique, qui sont engagés dans les conversations privées avec nous, ils sont tellement euh, euh, concernants avec les impacts dans leur circonscription, avec les déluges, puis de l'incendie, la chaleur, le de, de heat dome. Il y a les députés de Colombie-Britannique, puis d'Ontario, puis de Québec, qui sont les conservateurs qui pensent qu'on doit agir. Mais même que, comme les libéraux dans le backbenchers, le parti, ils restent silencieux pour la hypocrisie de leur chef libéral, puis pour les mensonges énormes de, de, de députés et le, le chef du Parti conservateur. Je pense que le problème, ce n'est pas 
que les conservateurs ne sont pas capables de comprendre les sciences. Le problème, c'est qu'ils ont une idée pour diviser la population de Canada pour le base contre la science de changement climatique. Est-ce qu'il y a des arguments pour les convaincre? Oui, et bien sûr, parce qu'il comprend bien la science, vraiment. Mais il utilise les slogans, euh, les arguments seulement partisans pour diviser la population qui, euh, du Canada, comme on dit en anglais, « the dog whistles », pour euh, ré, euh, augmenter leur appui dans un, un, un groupe minoritaire au Canada, pour mobiliser cette groupe de voter conservateur. Je pense qu'il a fait un, un erreur. Avec les feux de forêt, il n'y a pas un feu de forêt seulement qui menace les conservateurs, qui menace les MPD, qui menace les... Non, les feux de forêt menacent tout et tous. Et même chose les déluges, même chose les tempêtes énormes comme Fiona. Il n'y a pas... Euh, en anglais, I'm thinking there's no atheists in foxholes, we used to say. There's no partisans when you're sheltering and you've been evacuated from your homes. Je pense que M. Poiliev a fait une erreur grave parce qu'il a l'idée que... Et ce n'est pas une question des argumentations. C'est une question de uh, Mme Jenny Byrne qui lui donne les talking points. Et il, uh, il, il a fait une décision de, 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 de devenir uh, la version canadienne de Donald Trump. J'espère Je, qu'il il est un erreur stratégique pour son parti et j'espère qu'il va euh, euh, changer les, les politiques du Parti conservateur. Trans Mountain, it's nearly 80% complete. Is it just too late to pull the plug no. on this? No. I had this conversation recently with some prominent liberals. It's a threat. It's not merely a project, it's a threat to the Salish Sea, the marine environment of southern coastal British Columbia. There's a reason that the governor, Jay Inslee, and Washington state's government has asked Canada not to build the pipeline. We're acting as if it's a pipeline. Well, the pipeline does a lot of damage along its 800-kilometer route. And the parts that aren't finished yet, by the way, are the hardest parts running the pipeline under rivers, uh, going through more sensitive habitat. It's expensive. But the point of this pipeline is not to deliver, as the previous pipeline, which will continue, this is not replacing a pipeline, this is a completely new project. The old Trans Mountain Pipeline, built in the 1950s, so truly old, continues to deliver crude to now what used to be four refineries in the Burnaby area, but to one so that British Columbians have a refinery and it produces gas for cars. The Trans Mountain expansion was never for domestic use at all. It's 100% for the export of a product that cannot be cleaned up in the marine environment. So as bad as Exxon Valdez was, any tanker spill from the port of the Trans Mountain facility in Burnaby And there will be spills because they are anticipating a massive increase in, in Aframax tankers. One spill will be devastating. It can't be cleaned up. Bitumen mixed with diluent to get a solid thing, bitumen, to flow through a pipeline creates a, a monstrous new product that in the marine environment cannot be cleaned up. So it's never too late to stop it. If they'd finished it and started shipping things, for God's sakes, stop it. It's an accident waiting to happen to destroy our coastlines, wipe out the southern resident killer whale, destroy our fishing. It will destroy tourism. It's a massive threat to us in British Columbia, to Washington State, as it is to the marine life. And for added fun, It increases a market case for expanding the oil sands for the heaviest carbon oil produced in Canada. So, just how do you respond then to what the pipeline and liberals would say that this 
is about displacing Russian oil. We talked about drilling in the Arctic. Canada is not drilling in the Arctic. The U.S. is not drilling in the Arctic Ocean. I mean, but Russia is. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if anyone's going to be exporting this product, shouldn't it be Canada with our environmental standards and all of that? No. <laughs> We have, as a planet, very clear, as, as a species, we have clear instructions from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We know the science. We are at the very edge of too late, as I was saying earlier in French. We're, we're right up against it. If we're going to hold to a climate which allows human civilization to survive, Greenhouse gas levels must stop rising and start falling rapidly before 2025. That was the advice from the sixth assessment report, uh, the summary of which came out in March of this year. The last report on this it was April 2022. It's very clear that there is no space in the atmosphere for emissions from Russian oil or Canadian oil or any oil. We have to move in a planned, staged fashion to move off fossil fuels altogether. What we must not do is add. We can't go to zero overnight, and I'm not suggesting we would. Saying, we have to stop adding and start subtracting. So Canada should be able to say, no new areas will be opened up for oil and gas, particularly if they're in a protected area, but no new oil and gas should be developed. No new coal fields should be developed. We are in the fight of our lives to protect all of human civilization from levels of climate crisis to which we can no longer adapt. Where we are now, right now, in this crisis, where Canadian wildfires are clouding out the vision of the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor, where we are right now is due to a global average temperature increase of 1.1 degrees Celsius. We are trying to hold to 1.5 degrees. We committed to do that in the Paris Agreement. I can't find any scientists who really believe we can now hold to 1.5. Some hope we can still hold to as far below 2 degrees as possible. That's a bigger number than those who think we can hold to 1.5 but there's not many who think we can hold to below two. If we hit tipping points in the atmosphere that unleash runaway global warming, self-accelerating and unstoppable, we all bets are off for whether human civilization, through the geopolitical impacts of this kind of intense climate instability, the geopolitical impacts will hasten the rise of fascism. We are in the fight of our lives, and we're pretending that the Trans Mountain Pipeline is in Canada's national interest. That's the biggest lie ever said. Finally, um, yeah, well, maybe not final. <laughs> you were not at the Pride flag raising. Yes, I was. Hill. Yeah, the you Prime Minister there. acknowledged I was there. Okay, you were there. Okay, yeah. never mind then. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Well, maybe I'll ask you this, and I apologize for Mike that. and I were I both there, by the way. You were, I apologize. The Prime that. Minister acknowledged I was there. He didn't acknowledge that the entire Green Party caucus was present. <laughs> uh, incorrect information, or I misunderstood the information. Okay, sorry. I, was given. I apologize. Um, what do you think about um, Mr. Blanchet and uh, um, Pauliev not being there? Well, they're, they're, they had members of Parliament present, and I, I'm not going to second guess the schedules for other leaders, but uh, Melissa Lansman was there and left before it was over, but she was there as deputy leader of the Conservative Party. And uh, several Bloc Québécois members were there. Uh, Adrienne Larouche, for one. Last year at the Pride flag raising, all of us were invited to speak. So Melissa Lansman spoke, Adrienne Larouche spoke, I spoke, Jagmi Singh spoke. So, but there were a lot of members of parliament there, and we weren't all, not all acknowledged. Mr. Poiliev, I think, made a mistake by not being there. but. Who knows uh, what was on his calendar for the day? Concernant la de Irving Oil au Nouveau-Brunswick, d'abord, j'aimerais avoir votre réaction là-dessus. Can you ask, sorry. Just to add to the question, David, to be clear, it's a disappointment that not every party leader was there this morning. And Elizabeth and I share that, dis that disappointment. Well, I'll, I'll leave the party no, no, leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, 
This is a moment for all elected people to stand together to say that love is love, and it's a very reasonable expectation to have every single party leader there present. Even though you're up in the House of Commons till 12, yeah. talking, like yeah. fighting for inflation and cost of living, I mean, that's, that's an important issue too. Uh, um, y yes. <laughs> this uh, elected folks here have the ability to, to, yes, debate late into the evening, as we both did on Monday night when it and came to Tuesday the wildfires, night. and be right back at it early the next morning. I don't see that as any reason why you wouldn't have every single party leader there. Sorry. Concernant Irving Oil, peut-être en français et en anglais, s'il vous plaît, votre réaction à cette restructuration-là et comment vous l'expliquez, vous? Oui, je pense que c'est une surprise, vraiment, que Irving Oil, qui est l'entreprise à Saint-Jean-Nouveau-Brunswick, qui a, 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 a profité de tous les largesse du gouvernement de Nouveau-Brunswick, puis du gouvernement fédéral, toujours. Euh, c'est clair que euh, tout, presque toute l'économie de Nouveau-Brunswick, c'est euh, dans l'intérêt de la famille Irving. L'entreprise le, le, euh, le, forestière, l'entreprise de média aussi, c'est une, euh, c'est euh, notre version ici au Canada, Banana Republic, c'est le Nouveau-Brunswick, la propriété de Irving. Mais je pense que euh, c'est clair que dans la vie de l'expert de la Conseil de conservation de Nouveau-Brunswick, Louise Como, qui a dit que c'est quelque chose de bizarre ici. Peut-être qu'il va utiliser la situation avec les règlements pour protéger l'environnement contre l'intérêt d'économie de Nouveau-Brunswick. J'espère que c'est seulement un, un effort de peut-être comme Irving a fait en, au passé sur les questions forestières, de faire un, un, un petit, um, ce n'est pas petit, c'est grand, um, et pardonnez-moi pour, j'ai oublié les mots, pour job blackmail. C'est toujours une tactique de négociation de l'entreprise Irving J'espère que non. Peut-être c'est vraiment, honnêtement, un effort, un effort de, pour, la pour faire une gestion différente pour le multiple <rire> entreprise et industrie au Nouveau-Brunswick. Nouveau euh, mais euh, on attend pour le, les, les décisions. Mais je pense que c'est euh, maintenant, euh, il... il je, il y a inquiétude pour l'économie du Nouveau-Brunswick et la motivation d'entreprises de, Irving pour, pour leur annonce. Oh, okay. Well, it's very hard to know what Irving might be doing with making an announcement that it's considering restructuring and not keeping its refinery going in St. John, New Brunswick. Uh, that is uh, over the years, and I've, I've, I've watch the Irvings closely uh, uh, over the years that the enterprise of the Irvings basically owns New Brunswick between the forest operations, the pulp mills, the refinery, the bus lines, and then owning much of the media. And it, it is uh, uh, in, a, in a very significant way uh, uh, anti-democratic in the way it functions in New Brunswick. And when Parties like and, and party leaders like David Kuhn and the great leader of the Green Party of New Brunswick stands up against the Irvings. There are other politicians who applaud, but very quietly because they're scared to take on the Irvings. I, I also think that um, the uh, expert on climate within the Conservation Council of New Brunswick, Louise Camo, who was quoted in the media, expressed the same view that I do. Basically, it might be that this is an honest review of their competitive position and market forces and restructuring their own enterprises. But it might also be what we've seen in the past from the Irvings, a threat that improves the, their negotiating tactics with the federal government on uh, clean fuel standards, with the provincial government. In other words, uh, this could be job blackmail to get their way on other issues. Thank you.